Section 12 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 12 the Canadian Children of the Cold. After centuries of seclusion and neglect, broken only by the infrequent visits of ambitious seekers for the North Pole, or mercenary hunters for the right whale, and by the semi-religious, semi-commercial ministrations of the Moravian missionaries, the Eskimos of the Labrador and Hudson Bay region suddenly had the eyes of the world turned inquiringly upon them. The shocking story was published far and wide that a winter that did not change to spring in the usual way had cut off their supply of food, and that in consequence they were devouring one another with the ghastly relish of a Fiji cannibal. Although this report proved untrue, happily, the Eskimos are sufficiently interested to attract attention at all times, and are little enough known to furnish an adequate excuse at this time for a brief paper upon them. 1. To aid me in presenting the earliest glimpses of the Eskimos, I am fortunate in having before me a manuscript prepared by the late Robert Morrow of Halifax, Nova Scotia, an accomplished student of the literatures of Iceland and Denmark, that to the Norsemen and not to the Spaniards rightfully belongs the credit of first discovering America is now settled, and that when the Norsemen first touched American soil, they found the Eskimos already in possession is also certain. Yet it was not these bold adventurers that gave these curious people the name by which they are most commonly known. In the expressive Norse tongue, they were described as skrelings, that is, the chips herrings. The intention was not, of course, to convey the idea that they were cordially accepted as chips of the old block, but, on the contrary, to show that they were regarded by their handsome and stalwart discoverers as little better than mere fragments of humanity, a view which, however unflattering, their squat stature, ugly countenances, and filthy habits went far to justify. The name Eskimo was given to them by the Abenaki, a tribe of Indians in southern Labrador. It is an abbreviation of Eskimoatsek, which means eating raw fish, in allusion to the repulsive custom of eating both fish and flesh without taking the preliminary trouble of cooking it. The Eskimos themselves assert very emphatically that they are into it, that is, the people, just as though they were the only people in the world. And, by the way, it is worth noticing that each particular tribe of these huskies think itself the entire population of the globe, until undeceived by the advent of visitors. Their national name, if they have one at all, is Karalit, the plural of Karalik, meaning those that stay behind. With reference to this latter title, Mr. Morrow points out a curious fact, which is suggestive. Strollenberg, in his description 
of the northern part of Asia, states, on the authority of the Tartar writer Abul Ghazi Chan, that Og, or August Chan, who reigned in Tartary long before the birth of Christ, made an inroad into the southern Asiatic countries, and as some of his tribes stayed behind, they were called in reproach Kal Atsi, and also Karalik. Now this Karalik, with its plural Klaralit, is the very name that the Eskimos gave themselves, so striking a resemblance, amounting in fact to identity, can surely be accounted for in no other way, and for this suggestion I must assume all responsibility, than that those who stayed behind in Tartaris subsequently moved over to the American continent. When Eric the Red sailed across from Iceland to Greenland, somewhere about the year 985, he found many traces of the Eskimos there, and when Thorvald, some twenty years later, ventured as far south as Vinland, identified as the present Martha's Vineyard, with which he was so delighted that he exclaimed, here is a beautiful land, and here I wish to raise my dwelling. The unexpected discovery of three skin boats upon the beach affected him and his followers much as the imprint of a human foot did Robinson Crusoe. They found more than the boats, however, for each boat held three men, all but one of whom they caught and summarily dispatched for reasons that the saga discreetly forbears to state. But retribution followed fast. No sooner had the invaders returned to their ships than the Skraelings attacked them in great force, and although the Norsemen came out best in the fighting, their leader, Thornvald, received a mortal wound. He charged his men to bury him upon the cape at which he had thought it best to dwell, for, as he pathetically added, it may happen that it was a true word that fell from my mouth that I should dwell here for a time. His men did as they were bid. They set up two crosses over his grave, whose site is now known as Summit Point. They then hastened homeward. After the lapse of two years, when Thornwin Karlsefori fired by what he heard in Iceland of the wonderful discoveries made by the hardy sons of Eric the Red, fitted out an imposing expedition. His boats carried 160 men, besides women, cattle, etc., and set sail for Vinland. He reached his destination in safety, and, remaining there for some time, improved upon his predecessor's method of treating the Skraelings. Instead of aimlessly killing them, he cheerfully cheated them, getting huge packs of furs in exchange for bits of red cloth. He has thus described his customer's chief characteristics. These men were black and ill-favored, and had straight hair on their heads. They had large eyes and broad cheeks. All of which shows that although the Eskimos have changed their habitat since then, they have not altered much in their appearance. After two years of prosperous trading, the relations between the Norsemen and the Skraelings became strained from a cause too amusing not to be related. As already stated, the visitors brought a few of their cattle with them, and it happened one day that a huge bull had his feelings excited some way or other perhaps by a piece of red cloth thoughtlessly paraded in his views. At all events, 
he bellowed very loud, and charging upon the terrified Eskimos, tossed them about in the most lively fashion. They incontinently tumbled into their boats, and, without a word of farewell, rowed off to the vast amusement of the bull's owners. But the latter's laughter vanished when presently the runaways returned in whole ranks like a rushing stream and began an attack in which the Norsemen were vanquished by sheer force of numbers and deemed it prudent to make off without standing upon the order of their growing. Two. With the departure of the Norsemen, the curtain of obscurity falls upon the Eskimos and is not lifted again until we find them not luxuriating amid the vine-entangled forests of Vinland, but scattered far and wide over the hideous desolation of the far north and engaged in a ceaseless struggle with hunger and cold. Just when they thus moved northward and why does not yet appear if their innate and intense hatred of the red indian be of any service as a clue it is however within the bounds of reason to believe that they were driven from their comfortable quarters by their more active and warlike fellow aborigines and given no rest until they found it amidst the icebergs and glaciers of Labrador and Hudson Bay, where they may now be met with in bands numbering from a dozen to a hundred or more. Throughout the whole of this Arctic region, they fearlessly range in search of food. The Eskimos are, in fact, the only inhabitants of a vast territory which includes the shores of Arctic America, the whole of Greenland, and a tract about 400 miles long on the Asiatic coast beyond Bering Strait, thus extending over a distance of 5,000 miles from east to west and 3,200 miles from north to south. Notwithstanding this wide distribution, there is a remarkable uniformity, not only in the physical features of the Eskimos, but also in their manners, traditions, and language. Consequently, very much that may be said of the Canadian children of the cold, that is, the Eskimos of Labrador and Hudson Bay, would be equally true of the other branches of the race. For a great deal of interesting information concerning them, we are indebted to the writings of such men as Ribach and Hertzberg, Moravian missionaries, who, with a heroic zeal that only those familiar with their lot can adequately appreciate, have devoted themselves to the cure of souls among the Eskimos. There are six of these Moravian missions scattered along the eastern coast of Labrador. Nain, the chief one, was established as far back as 1771. Okak, in 1776, Hopedale, in 1782, and Hebron, Zor, and Rama more recently. The bestowal of so attractive biblical names helps very little, however, to mitigate the unfavorable impression produced by the forbidding surroundings of these tiny oases almost lost in a seemingly illimitable desert. Sheer from the sea, except where broken by frequent gulf and fjord, the coastline towers up in tremendous and unpitying sternness and at its base the breakers thunder with a force and fury that knows little pause throughout the year. From end to end the shore is jagged like a gigantic saw 
with innumerable bays and inlets, sprinkled thick with islands and underlaid with hidden reefs, which made these waters difficult to find and dangerous to navigate. The interior of the country is equally repellent, although toward the west it becomes less mountainous and slightly undulating like the American prairie. It presents nothing but an inhospitable and savage wilderness covered with immense forests broken by numerous swamps and lakes and untouched by human foot, save when now and then a band of red Indians venture thither, lured by the hope of food and fur. The Eskimos upon the eastern coast of Labrador are, as a rule, small of stature, not much exceeding five feet. Those upon the western shore, however, are taller and more robust. They are quite strongly built, with hair and beard sweeping down over the shoulders and chest. When the good seed sown by the patient missionary finds lodging in a husky's heart, he usually signalizes his adoption of Christianity by indulging in a clean shave, or at least by cutting his beard short with a pair of scissors, in deference, perhaps, to the judgment of St. Paul that, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. They have small, soft hands, broad shoulders, big, flat faces, large, round heads, and short, stubby noses. Tip tilted like the petals of a flower and very generous mouths, which begin nearly always on the broad grin, make free display of fine rows of sharp white teeth. In complexion they are tawny and ruddy, and the face is of a much darker shade than the body. At springtime, when the sun's burning rays are reflected from glistening banks of snow, they become almost black in face as negroes, but newborn babes may be seen as fair as any English child. Their eyes are small and almost uniformly black, and peep brightly out at you from underneath a perfect forest of brow and lash. Their hair is black also, and very thick and coarse. Their ordinary food is the flesh of the seal with its attendant blubber, and the fish that abound along the shore. They are not particular whether their dinner is cooked or not, and I seriously question whether a professional pugilist in the height of his training could swallow his beefsteak as rare as the Eskimos will their seal cutlets. They are also very partial to tallow, soap, fish oil, and such things, which they look upon as great delicacies, a big tallow candle being rather more of a treat to an Eskimo youngster than a stick of candy to a civilized small boy. That these peculiar and decidedly repulsive tastes are, after all, bottomed on the laws of nature is clearly shown by the fact that when the natives around a mission station adopt a European diet, and they soon become passionately fond of bread and biscuits, they inevitably grow weak and incapable of standing the intense cold. When Joe, that heroic Eskimo who supported Hall's expedition by his hunting, after Hall himself had died, was transplanted to America and thence to England, he soon languished and grew consumptive despite every effort to preserve his health. On joining Captain Young in the Pandora, his only remark 
uttered with a depth of eager, confident hope that was very touching, was, By and by, get little seal meat, then all right. A prediction that was fulfilled to the very letter when he regained his native ice. As soon as they killed their first seal, Joe was given free rein, and he began to revive at once. His hollow cheeks resumed their old-time chubbiness, and smeariness too, no doubt. His languor left him, and he was, in short, another man. The seal is, in fact, everything to the Eskimo, what the buffalo was to the American Indian, what the reindeer is to the European Laplander, all that, and still more, is the seal to these children of the cold. Upon its meat and blubber they feed, with its fur they are clothed, by its oil they are warmed and lighted, stretched upon appropriate framework, its skin makes them seaworthy boats and weatherproof tents, while unkindness use of all with its bladder they float the fatal harpoon that wrought its own undoing. To sum it all up in one sentence, take away the seal, and the Eskimo could not exist for a month. There is not much room for fashion's imperious sway in Labrador. Seal skin from scalp to toe is the invariable rule and there would be no small difficulty in distinguishing between the sexes if the women did not indulge in a certain amount of ornamentation upon their garments and further indicate their femininity by appending to their sacures a curious tail reaching almost to the ground which they renew whenever it becomes so dirty as to shock even their sluggish sensibilities. Still another distinguishing mark, permissible, however, only to those who attain the dignity of motherhood, is the amuk, a capacious hood hung between the shoulders, which forms the safest and snuggest of all carrying places for babies that otherwise would be in arms. 3. Seal Hunting In addition to the records of the Moravian missionaries, the reports of the Arctic explorers and the stories brought back by whalers concerning the Eskimos, much information has been gained of late through the measures taken by the Canadian government to determine the practicability of Hudson Bay as a commercial highway. For three successive years, expeditions on an extensive scale have been dispatched to that little known region, and observing stations have been maintained throughout the year at different points along the coast of Labrador and the shores of that great inland sea, which has not inappropriately been termed the Mediterranean of Canada. As one result of these expeditions, much attention has been drawn to the natives. Lieutenant Gordon, who has commanded all three, has many kind words for them. He finds them docile, amiable, and willing to work, and apparently much pleased with the prospect of increased intercourse with the white man. Occasionally, one is met that has been sufficiently enterprising to acquire the English language, while many others understand well enough what is said to them in that language, although they cannot be persuaded to speak it. They are wildly fond of any article of civilized clothing, and the head man at one settlement exhibited no little pride in the possession of the stand-up linen collar almost worthy to be placed beside one of Mr. Gladstone's, 
although he displayed it to the utmost advantage he did not like the fiji chieftain consider all other clothing superfluous when stores were being landed at the stations the eskimos would gather about and offer their services which were always accepted and then all day long they would toil cheerfully side by side with their white brethren requiring no other remuneration than biscuits when so much had been written by arctic explorers about the incorrigible kleptomania of the natives it is no less a matter for surprise than for gratification that lieutenant gordon can bear this testimony as to the moral status of the eskimos at hudson bay one word may be said in regard to their honesty all those scraps of iron and wood possess a value to them which we can hardly appreciate they would take nothing without first asking leave not even a chip or broken nail was taken without their first coming to ask permission of the officer who was on duty no doubt the fact that practical prohibition prevails has something to do with this highly commendable showing the law aided and abetted by the vigilant missionaries shuts out everything stronger than lime juice and the path of the eskimo is free from the most seductive and dis destructive of all temptations except when some unprincipled whaler offers him a pull out of his flask this however is a rare occurrence and there is no record of any such disturbance ever having been raised as would in more highly civilized communities call for the interference of the police although the simplicity of their life and their freedom from many modern vices conduce to longevity these advantages are more than counterbalanced by the strain put upon their constitutions by the severity of the climate and the incessant struggle for food consequently they soon age and seldom live beyond sixty years the doctrine that cleanliness is next to godliness finds few adherents in eskimo land the rule seems to be to eschew washing throughout the year and many a mightier hunter goes through life innocent of a bath unless indeed he should happen to be tumbled out of his kayak by some irate walrus with other than sanitary designs in mind mr tuttle the historian of the first hudson bay expedition is authority for the statement that the children when very young are sometimes cleaned by being licked with their mother's tongue before being put into the bag of feathers that serves them as bed cradle and blanket but one cannot help thinking that this particular version of a lick and a promise is rather too laborious to have extensive vogue so familiar has the world been made through the medium of arctic exploration literature with the igloos huts kayaks and umiaks boats sledges dogs harpoons and other possessions of these people which are precisely the same wherever they may be found that reference to them seems unnecessary especially as the canadian eskimos offer nothing peculiar but before concluding a few words must be added as to the intellectual and moral characteristics of the race their intelligence is considerable in some instances they display not only a taste but a talent for music chart making and drawing one case is mentioned where a mere lad drew an excellent outline of the coast for over a hundred miles indicating its many irregularities with astonishing accuracy 
They are capital mimics and are apt at learning the songs and dances of their white visitors. But they are poor men of business. They generally leave to the purchaser the fixing of the price of anything they have to sell. It is said that in their private lives, their state of morality is low, although they avoid indecency calculated to give public offense. Stealing and lying were unknown among them until these black arts were introduced by the whites as products of civilization, and, unhappily, the natives are proving apt pupils. They are also somewhat given to gambling, although by no means without courage they seldom quarrel, and never go to war with one another. As to religion, the Eskimos, before they accepted Christianity, had little or none that was worthy of the name. They believe in the immortality of the soul, but liberally extend this document to the lower animals also, which they endow with souls. They hold also that human souls can pass into the bodies of these very animals. With respect to the higher powers, their creed is that the world is ruled by supernatural beings whom they call owners, and as almost every object has its owner, this would seem to be a kind of panatheism. After death, human souls go either up or down, but in curious contrast to the belief of all other races, the good, in their opinion, go to the nether world, where they bask in a land not of milk and honey, but of inexhaustible seal meat and blubber. The bad, on the other hand, go to the upper world, where they suffer what a fashionable preacher euphemized as eternal uneasiness, not from excess of heat, but from frost and famine. There they are permitted to lighten their misery by playing ball with a walrus head, which diversion, by the way, in some inexplicable fashion, gives rise to the aurora borealis. Like all aborigines, they have their own legend of the deluge, and to this day they proudly point out a large island lying between Okak and Hebron, rising to the height of nearly 7,000 feet, which they claim was the only spot left uncovered by the flood, and upon which a select party of their antediluvian ancestors survived the otherwise all-embracing catastrophe. The future destination of this interesting race may be readily forecast. In common with the Red Indian of the Plains, the swarthy Eskimo may adopt, with reference to the white man, those words of fathomless pathos uttered by John the Baptist in reference to the Messiah. He must increase, but I must decrease. It is merely a question of time. All over the vast region he inhabits are signs showing that his numbers were far greater once than they are at present. The insatiable greed of his white brothers is rendering his existence increasingly difficult. The seal and the walrus are ever being driven farther north, and that means a sterner and shorter struggle for life. As the Indian will not long survive the buffalo, so the Eskimo will not long survive the seal. There are perhaps 15,000 of them now scattered far and wide over the tremendous spaces between Labrador and Alaska. Each year their numbers are growing less, and ere long the last remnants of the race will have vanished, and the great lone north will return to the state of appalling solitude and silence 
that only the Canadian children of the cold had the fortitude to alleviate by their presence. End of section 12